Now the Flyers may even this up. Konechny gets sticks up high, sticks up high, sticks up high. Welcome to Sticks Up High, a phillysportsnetwork.com production. I'm your host, Matt Stinger, also known as Delco Dope on Twitter. You can follow along there, follow along here, or follow along on Facebook. Sticks Up High, phillysportsnetwork.com. All right, and it's welcome into Sticks Up High. I am your host, Matt Stinger. Thanks for following along. It is a... Very well, it's a depressing day for us Flyers fans as the Flyers drop a heartbreaker to the Buffalo Sabres 5-3. to three. They they had this one, and um, they let it slip away. It came out the right way, started the right way. Everything was looking great for the Flyers, but just couldn't, couldn't get it done. So um, where did they go from here? I'm not sure. Well, they go to Washington, or they have Washington, and um, they face the Caps. And then they face the Penguins. And if they're going to right this ship, it has to be done now. But it's, there's just too many problems, too many issues that the Flyers are trying to overcome. And I don't, I don't think you're going to see it. They're going to probably stand fast at the trade deadline because there's no reason to go out and make a trade right now unless you're going to get some valuable pieces for um, some of your role players. But um, you, you, anything here you're going to trade, you're probably – not looking for a player back, but you're probably looking to move pieces and free up some cap. Um, Michael Roffle didn't play today. Could he be on a move? We'll find out. We'll find out tomorrow um, as the trade deadline approaches. Deals are starting to come in. Nick Felino to the Maple Leaves. David Savard to the Florida – or no, I'm sorry, Tampa Bay Lightning. So they're coming, so stick, stick to the uh, – NHL Network, TSN's Trade Center, and um, see what's going on um, going on there in the uh, world of the trades. But don't look for the Flyers to be involved in going after that big piece. I don't see it happening. This team's just not good enough. They, they're not good enough, and it's it's kind of one of those things where it's like, why, why even go for it? So, um, yeah. Yeah. Um, in a minute, I will be joined by Eric Reese of Philly Sports Network. Eric is um, one of our main content writers. In fact, he actually is the main content writer. Eric has been really driving the train here at, at Philly Sports Network with Flyers coverage. So you can follow him here on um, Philly Sports Network. And he, he's pretty much putting out a feature almost daily. Um, he, he really, like I said, he, he keeps us all in, in, um, relevant, I guess you should say with the Flyers coverage, because without him, we would just be, we would just not be covering as much as we'd like to, you know, we all have our, our day jobs, if you would. And, um, Eric just always seems to find time to, to, uh, crank out that feature or the game prep or the game, um, the game wrap, you know, the wrap up. He does a he does a really good job, and uh, he'll be he'll be joining us. We'll be talking a little flyers, what they're going to do, and 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 uh, who knows what we're going to get into. It was just going to be an unscripted conversation. Frustrations, let it show. So uh, hang tight as we get Eric in here, and we can see what he has to say as he joins the podcast for his first visit to the podcast. All right, as promised, joining me on the Sticks Up High podcast is Philly Sports Network main contributor, Eric Reese. Eric, how are you? I'm doing as great as you can after a monumental collapse kind of performance that the Flyers uh, put out today. But nonetheless, hopes are still alive after the Bruins were demolished by a touchdown almost of goals. And um, the Islanders just defeated the Rangers not that not too long ago in overtime so i guess the flyers will now be sixth placed um in the standings but still four points out so you know it's a rough day but everything's all right everything's okay yeah the the flyers just are like a rudderless ship right now they're just kind of floating around and and it's it's a shame because you see like like the play like Giroux has he's elevated it and tried to carry the team on his back it, 
during some of the, the stretch here. But the Flyers right now don't have that scary threat. You know, there, there's nobody with the puck on his stick that is, is saying, yes, we can get a goal. He's going to score right now. And it, it's almost like they peppered Olmark today and should have had seven goals. I mean, they, they had chance after chance and just couldn't bury it. So uh, what gives? I, you know, it's funny. As soon as the Flyers start peppering goaltenders is when they don't score. And as soon as they, you know, maybe shoot 15 to 20 times a game is when they're the most efficient. Um, and, and a lot of people, and I think Gosses Bear put it perfect uh, after the win against the Bruins in regulation. He's like, um, because he was asked that question by Keith Jones. He's like, but well, how do you make sense of that? I'm like, well, when you're playing from behind, you're, you know, you're shooting as many times from really anywhere. And when you're playing ahead, you're kind of looking for the, you know, the best shots and you're a little bit more calculated. So I think what gives in the matter of us losing these uh, games and shooting like sometimes, you know, 40 shots a game, like especially against a goaltender like Jeremy Swayman in his debut. I mean, he stopped uh, 40 of 42. I think part of that is we take a lot of shots from the outside. And if you look at the numbers, on the on opposing defenses and the shots blocked, we're not shooting from high percentage areas. And, and Elaine Vigneault's whole system is just getting the high percentage areas, getting the slot, getting the gritty areas. And we, we, we're playing a more finesse style than we need, kind of need to be that, you know, that gritty, it had that gritty uh, forward check. And then we were doing fine with that at the beginning of the season. So uh, to me, we've, we've lost sight of that. And defensively we're trying to find a little bit of an identity but you know the last three minutes of today's game would disagree with that completely yeah it, it seems unfortunately from what I see out there and uh, a couple of weeks ago I had uh, Colby Cohen on for an interview now unfortunately I think something happened with the podcast but it, it didn't get on there but one of the things he talked about was as a defenseman the Flyers were doing a lot of puck watching you know, they're in position. They just weren't stick checking or anything. And and you saw that today on the fourth goal is that Provorov was right there. And I'd have to go back and see it. But um, the the Sabre, who was it? Uh, was it Middlestat? Kind of just lost Braun a little bit, cut to that front, and was wide open for a, a tap-in. And Carter Hart had no chance. And when you watch the replay from behind the net, it looked like Provorov was just watching where the puck was and didn't even pick up on middle stats. So when you got our stud horse on the blue line, puck watching as well as everybody else, that's a recipe for disaster. That's kind of why, like, so when I've, when I've looked at, uh, I've been paying like, close attention to players like Robert Hegg uh, coming back into the lineup because I don't know if you just saw that, but that was, oh, that was awesome thunder behind me. But, uh, yeah, Robert Hag uh, coming back into the lineup, I see the kind of uh, the, f- the physical play that he brings and what he does uh, defensively. And I think that that's a missing, a, a key missing component with a lot of our, um, with a lot of our defense. I think we have a lot of guys who normally would be great you know, on the line as a uh, power play is concerned, or maybe on scoring chances. And I think that to our detriment, that's, that's kind of, you know, we're paying for that on the back end when we go against these high powered teams like the Capitals, like the Islanders, like, you know, even the Bruins. I mean, how many times have we seen Bergeron uh, just kind of march or, you know, hang out in the slot and just, you know, put one home. I mean, it's, it's probably about eight times, honestly, um, including the one that he had uh, over the weekend on Saturday. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's always someone sneaking in. Uh, or camped out and not getting roughed up. And that was a major complaint of, you know, a bunch of us throughout the beginning of the, and the majority of the season. And when Haig went out, you know, that became amplified and magnified of the lack of toughness on the blue line, the lack of putting a body on somebody. So they, they bring up Sam Arn and he is just a physical specimen. <laughs> now, unfortunately, it's like every time he hits someone, they're calling him for a penalty of some sort. And, you know, he does – he will take that dumb penalty. But, you know, he's he's trying to make a difference out there in the way that 
they need him. They need him to be physical. They need him to clear out in front of the net. And he's done a really decent job of that. And, and I mean, I just, I like him on the third line uh, or the third pairing. I like Haig, you know, because Haig brings that toughness. I mean, look at, look at Haig today. You take a slot swat at Carter Hart, you're going to pay the price. And uh, Dylan Cl- Cousins right. thought he was going to sneak one in there being cute. I don't know where he thought he was playing, but you know, the big Swede would have none of it. And that was a melee. When I'm watching that, I don't know how you felt about it, but I'm going, this is it. This is right now the turning point that you're going to bring the Flyers together as a unit. Everybody was involved. Faraby was wrenching somebody's neck. Couturier's in there. Uh, Sanheim just, like, pushed Cousins around like he was nothing, you know? I mean, at that moment, were you thinking like I was? Like, this is it. This is the they're, – they're coming together – and this is going to be the catalyst that kind of pushes them forward. Oh, absolutely. As soon as I saw Carter Hart um, kind of jump into that, and you usually don't see goaltenders. Like, they, you know, they just kind of stay away from the action, especially Hart. Um, as soon as I saw him kind of, you know, distance some Sabres players away from uh, the Flyers, I'm like, oh, okay, no, look at this. I'm here for this energy. Like, I like this a lot. And then, you know, it, it, it just it, – it seemed to me at that moment – that the Flyers are going to use that as momentum. Like, hey, you're going to have Carter Hart hop into this kind of scrum. You don't see that often. It reminded me of, and I mean, not like there was a fight between goaltenders, but when you saw like Ray Emery hop into like a fight, and you're like, okay, we got to have this kind of like energy. We got to have up this physicality. Well, when a goaltender like inserts themselves, that's no nonsense. So I thought the Philadelphia Flyers were going to grow off that. And then it wasn't too much longer later. I'm like, you know, it's probably the exact opposite. <laughs> I think we got yeah. a little bit – I think the Sabres uh, got into Carter Hart's head a little bit. Well, it was it was definitely <laughs> – it didn't go as, as we planned it, you know, or we hoped it because the Flyers obviously yeah. dropped one to the Sabres after going up 2 nothing in the first period. Finally, they've outscored an opponent in the first period, which they hadn't – and and the stats from, like, March on – the first period they've been absolute hard like they've just been really bad and outscored tremendously then they were fighting from behind which like you said before that makes that goal differential or not goal I'm sorry shot differential go but you know they had to lead and then all of a sudden two goals bam bam back to back shifts and then again two goals bam bam back to back shifts and it's like what happened like is it is it like are they playing like every Philly fan feels like as soon as something bad happens, like, well, here it is. You know, it's, you never feel comfortable. <laughs> so um, the Flyers do, and I'm pretty confident when I say this, I, I'm pretty sure. I don't, I don't know if there's an official stat or I don't know what the exact number is, but if I were to tell you that in minute or less sequences that other teams are scoring, you know, back-to-back goals, and the Flyers are allowing that the most out of any franchise in the league. Like, I'm pretty sure that sounds convincing. Um, I would say that the Flyers are probably the worst defense, especially when, you know, a team allows a goal and then allowing one, you know, 30 seconds to 45 seconds later. It's it's happened so many times against Boston, especially at Tahoe. Um, it, it, you know, t- today happens, what, twice? He said in back-to-back uh, shifts. Now, on my end, I, I worked the midday shift, so I did miss, you know, um, the Buffalo Sabres for two goals to tie the game. But I saw what I needed to see in the third period as far as, you know, how the defense responded and kind of gave away a lead. So it, it's it's frustrating. It's definitely frustrating, especially when you're watching this defense who's been lousy for the most part all I – mean, absolutely through all of March. But in April, you're like, okay, they're kind of getting their stuff together. You know, they're kind of they're, – they're playing these playoff teams very closely. And then you play a team where you're like, okay, you see the effort against the Bruins. You see the effort against the Islanders. Maybe the Flyers win this one in regulation, and they're two points out of a playoff spot. And it's the, and it's the Buffalo Sabres who at – the, they're at the bottom of the league, you know, hanging out with Ottawa. And then you, you lose five to three. You're like, man, you, you're three minutes away from – from a regulation, had you won in overtime today, you would have still, you know, if you forced overtime today, you would have still grown in the standings. It's frustrating. I mean, I'm getting frustrated talking about it. I can all understand what the locker room's going through. 
it, it, yeah, it's 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 just that that can't happen. You're you're fighting for your playoff life. That can't happen. And and you know, say what you want. And and I know it was talk about um, Skinner's goal being kicked in with a distinct kicking motion, and maybe it, it looked like kicking motion, and maybe Giroux helped facilitate that. But you know what? Don't let him be there. You know, play play stronger defense. Play play better. And it's just it's a frustrating as a fan to watch this type of hockey where where they're just not playing up to their potential. They're not able to score goals. They're not able to then and again there's there's really dumb decisions with the puck at time too. You know, you got guys that are looking to make a pass through four defensive sticks cross ice instead of, you know, pass it behind the net, fire it on net, something, you know. It's just one of those really frustrating frustrating things and I, and I thought they I thought they played better with the man advantage um in terms of that six on five at the end you know but again a, a silly right. decision a, a slap shot from the point when the the flyers were controlling the play and had the puck down deep you know it was kind of one of one of those decisions where you're like why why take that slap shot there now luckily they were able to keep it in the zone and it didn't just go flying back in their own empty net, but there seems to be a lack of of confidence right now in terms of getting the puck in the net from everybody. So it's almost like a pass first mentality. And like you said before, they're trying to be finesse when they should just be gritty. They should be dirty. Yeah. Like Farabee's goal was not pretty. It was down grinding and, and to get him off the schneid. And, you know, that <laughs> uh, Lindblom's goal was not a – pretty shot or a deke it was he's going hard to the net off his skate you know that's what they do got they got to get back to that they got to get back to their identity of being a a grinding team because they're not they're not the the finesse teams they don't have that finesse uh scoring that you know like Crosby and McKinnon and and all the elite scorers of the league they don't have that so I mean, I don't know what the answer is. I don't know uh, what Fletcher plans on doing tomorrow, but. Um... Well, and, and speaking about the trade deadline, um, I think a lot of people, uh, there's, there's a difference between being thirsty for a trade and there's a difference between making a trade that makes sense. I, th I would like it, I'm, I'm, I'm torn because obviously the Flyers need help with a defensive defenseman or a two-way defenseman who has more defensive traits than they do offensive. Um, but if Chuck Fletcher does not make a move before the trade deadline, I'm not heartbroken because the one name that I see kind of trending everywhere with value that would be packaged in for uh, some sort of deal is Scott Lawton. And I'm not, I'm never ready to get rid of Scott Lawton. Like, honestly, I was um, you know, speaking with, speaking with uh, Ricky uh, earlier this week. I'm like, dude, we need to, we need to extend Lawton, like, now. Like, this guy is, when it wants, wants to crack and make their pick. And I think Lawton should be protected. Um, he's going to fill in for, you know, whoever's, whoever's leaving. And to me, it's, between like, okay, you're going to leave somebody expensive, exposed. So it's, it, is it border check or is it Van Ramsdyke? Either way, that's probably the person that goes because if you're the crack and you're watching the Flyers, you're not taking a defenseman at all. So no, that's out the window. You're not doing that. The only other person is Nolan Patrick, but there is so, and, or Nicholas Albe Kubel, but Nolan Patrick to me is somebody that, he has a lot to prove still. He's on a prove it deal with the Flyers right now because he's coming off of his migraines and he's kind of really just finding his, you know, groove again uh, this season. Albe Kubel, you respect the tenacity he shows on four checks, but he takes the untimely penalty. Like I was saying earlier, um, Albe Kubel has shades of a Zach Ronaldo to me, where 
he can score. He shows he can. He does it here and there. But the penalties that are at the worst time. But um, yeah, like I, I, I'm looking at the trade deadline. I don't think Fletcher makes any moves, and I think everybody's going to be very angry. And you know, just get ready for that. Um, but like, what else? What he let Shane Goss's bear go to waivers where nobody had to give you anything for him, and he cleared. Clearly, no one's interested, unless it's a unless it's a forward. And, I mean, barring, like, a blockbuster maneuver where it's like, okay, we're trading Boracek or something. I, I don't see anything happening before the trade deadline. I think a lot of this is affected because of the expansion draft coming up, where it's like we're losing something regardless. So if next season, let's say we do lose, you know, um, Boracek, that's $8 million, 250 or something like that off the cap. You know, or you lose a uh, JVR. That's like seven million off the cap. Now you have all this money to pick up a player. I and mean, by the way, you don't have Gustafson, which was a terrible idea to begin with. So that's three million off the cap. And then you got players like Andrew McDonald and Dave Schlemko that you're not uh, paying anymore on a buyout. So that's another like two million ish. Like you're making all this money up out of nowhere, and it's kind of a, it's a matter of like, okay, next season depending on what you want to do with re-signing players and who the crack can take, you have cap space to say, hey, we don't have to sacrifice anything. We don't have to make a move right now just to do it. You know, this season, let's not get over-analytic about it. You either do make the playoffs and, you, you know, it is what it is or you don't. But it really comes down to you can't sacrifice this season to make next season worse. And I think next season, like, Ekholm's still going to be there. Ekholm's still going to be a guy that, you know, is probably available. You, make, you can make a bargain with the, with, with the Predators. Unless he's traded, then that changes. But if that's still your target, like, there's, there's defensemen out there. You don't have to do it now because it happens to be a trade deadline. It's a trade deadline every year. Just, you know, make the right move. Yeah, it's – you're definitely going to gamble on Lawton, I think, unless they get that that deal done. But um, you know, he he uh, he is somebody I would want to keep because no matter what, the guy is giving you everything, and that's what you need. That kind of guy, and and I mean, he he could play anywhere. He will play anywhere. Um, I think he's a guy you protect. I thought it was a smart move by Hextall protecting him during the Vegas. Yeah. Um, because it's just a, uh, it was a smart move and he ended up being one of the best flyers on the ice at the beginning of the next, that next year. Um, but the trades, I, I think you're going to see that he's going to, Raffle may go. He's on an expiring contract. He might be somebody that someone's looking for a guy who can penalty kill and, and put the puck in the net every now and then and, and so forth. But, um, yeah, it's you, you can't just make a trade to make a trade. It's got to make the team better. And it, it's got to make it so it makes sense cap-wise. Um, I'm with you. I think you leave Voracek unprotected and see if they take uh, the crack and take them. Um, that's a huge, huge in cap relief. And why not? You know. And if he doesn't take them, you, you still got him back. And Jake's Jake's playing really well lately. He's uh, confident with the puck, and he's he's been playing really well. But if it's one of the two, him or JVR, and JVR's cooled off a bit, but. Like you said, that's the cap space you need, you know, and then maybe you go after Ekholm or, or you, you know, you go after an Ellis or, or somebody else that's right. out there, a top two defenseman. And then, you know, it fills that void Niskin and left, you know, it Proby can continue to grow. And then, you know, maybe that, that mentor helps Phil Myers develop into what we thought he was going to develop in, in the off season. Um, you think Phil Myers ends up, ends up uh, I don't know, like, this is just kind of a wild idea I had by watching, just because, you know, we've seen more in come in and the impact that he's had 
and watching uh, Hag over the past few games. You think uh, Phil Myers just all of a sudden becomes a uh, rotational seventh or maybe a trade guy? It it seems to be that way right now. I mean, he's just he hasn't had a consistent start to his year. Um, when when you thought he was going to be really good and he get after the injury the first couple games he I thought he played great and then he got injured and and then when he since he's been back it's been kind of like that uh you know making some questionable decisions you know but um I don't know what I don't know what their plan is with him I'd like to see them continue to use him I think he's he's very capable but he's got to fix the mistakes and he's got to play the way the coaches want him to, or he's going to continue to find himself getting, being a healthy scratch. Yeah, I mean, I, I, that's, that's exactly kind of how, how I've been thinking about it too. You see, uh, I mean, regardless if he's a, a rotating seventh or if he finds himself on the third line, because it's hard to argue, you know, Hag and Sandheim right now, uh, that combo works. So it, it's, if he ends up being a rotational seventh, I mean, as long as Gustafson is just out of the picture for the rest of the season, I'm happy because I think him not being on the ice gives the Flyers the best chance to win. Like, I, like from, from day one, and, like, this is just turning into just me, like, almost, like, you know, cutting a shoot on Gustafson. But, oh, my God, I thought it was a terrible idea. Like, like to me, you effectively paid Gustafson Bear $3 million more dollars. And last season, a lot of people were saying, oh, well, we want to trade Gosses Bear. Gosses Bear should be a trade piece. And I'm like, well, if that's the case, and Gustafson's basically just only a power play blue line specialist, with, I, don't, I, I never understood it. Like, I, I, I couldn't. I couldn't deal. I saw that sign happen, and I just immediately was like, my, my stomach turned. I, I hated it. I saw the points that he put up in Chicago. I just hated it. Yeah, and and you you mentioned that in our chats, our uh, PSN chats. I haven't been shy and, about um, it. <laughs> it was yeah, you weren't shy about it at all. And and the only thing I could think of is maybe you know they were looking for a ghost style player with a little bit more size, but it's not like he's towering or anything. He's got I think but like goes by an inch and maybe like 10 pounds you know and played more physical but but I don't know or or it was a panic move by Fletcher who had to all of a sudden he has to get somebody you know and and uh wasn't ready for Niskanen to just retire and and that that was it so um we could probably bash a defense all night long (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I like as much as I like it's easy to do I don't want to do that I just feel like that's been resonating all season long and I just needed to get it off my chest yeah. I promise it's done if Gustafson hears this I apologize but like it is what it is it's kind of how I feel <laughs> yeah, un- yeah understandable so all right the Flyers have the caps this Tuesday followed by the Penguins their their playoff hopes are dwindling they started 11 11- two and three, I believe, and they're now 19, 16, and six. So, I mean, the free fall is, they just can't figure it out. Um, it, it's it's mind-blowing considering, even though they were winning ugly in the beginning of the year, they were winning, you know, and, and um, it's just amazing how ever since they got shellacked in Lake Tahoe, which is really, I mean, how many Phantoms players were on that, Roster. That's exactly what I was going to bring up too. Yes, absolutely. It, but right, I I mean, yeah, they had the COVID and all that stuff. But you know what, the Bruins had the COVID too, and and you know what, they're still winning. Or, or I mean, not today, but you know, they aren't showing the lagging of it. I mean, everyone's dealing with the same stuff. We we can make excuses. I mean, the refs are they horrible this year? Absolutely. <laughs> That's my excuse. I mean, and they've been bad. I mean, let's just. Be I honest. haven't they, said that, but I've definitely been, called out. Like, is it is it is it good of me to is it on brand for me to tweet this? Right, talk about how. I bad the you know what? I, at times, I can't even. I can't. They. I mean, there's got to be some sort of transparency. You know, we always talk transparency with like right. all our leaders and like 
you know, if you go politics, which we're not going there, but, you know, transparency, everything's transparency until you get to official officials. And then there's no transparency whatsoever. These guys have been awful. All right. And, and I'm soapboxing this, <laughs> like getting off topic a little bit, but that's okay. They've been God awful. And, I, and it wasn't, it's not just the flyers. It's, it's league wide. I remember a couple of weeks ago watching, um, I, I was probably watching NHL network and they were showing the Bruins. I think, I don't remember who the uh, Bruins um, were playing, but they were um, on a power play. It may have even been on a five on three and Bergeron got tripped. And I mean, this wasn't like a, uh, I could see it. No, this guy sticks under the feet, pulled him right out from under him dropped Bergeron on his stomach and they didn't call it and the oh, no, uh there was one where one of the officials was like hot mic and they were like oh he, he, he like said that he called a penalty to offset another penalty I'm like, yeah so uh, uh, uh like, Tim Peel is that it yeah Dude. it was something I'm like man like it's no longer just a suspicion amongst fans like you really just admitted to it uh I you know if I don't play I don't mind that you know I mean we all know it's happening, you know, it's like, I mean, and, and I get the point you're, you're, you're giving a, a give back, you know, like, but, right. but some of them were, have just been, how is that not a penalty? Like the other night when the guy, who were they playing where uh, Sanheim got drilled into boards, the night more, more oh, that um, was, uh, the Islanders. was that the Islanders? Not much the longer Islanders. After more, more in got sent out. All right. Or Islanders, was, right. Up in, Yep. Yeah, that was the, uh, and then, yeah, the shootout loss, right? And then mm-hmm. I gets pushed into the boards. And, and it's, you know, it could have gone either way I in, in looking at the slow motion. But Sanheim stopping and the Islander player continues to push him into the boards and he goes in face first. I mean, it, it's a two-minute minor penalty for boarding because he's, he's pushing him into the boards. Yes, he didn't extend his arms, but he – did it to the point where Sandheim almost hits his face or does hit his face. And maybe Sandheim was selling it a little bit, which you think defenders, uh, none of the defenders ever sell it. Uh, oh, my face. Right. But not a penalty. And then they called in the overtime or was it, it might've been the end of the regulation. I think it was overtime. One of the weakest hooks I've ever seen. Was that the one on Kevin Hayes? Yeah, yeah, where he yeah. or I think it was Hayes, was it? it where he, the guy's in the middle of shooting and he goes to hit his stick and as he does that and his stick comes forward, Hayes' stick rides up into his hands and they're like, "Oh, that's a hook." And I'm like, "All right, I guess whatever. That's just it, uh, but you know, and that's me whining. I get it. I'm whining about a Flyers loss. Yes, I am. I tell you. <laughs> I don't make I don't hide any. I take this job of writing and covering flyers as a fan. I am a fan and I always will be, you know, it's hard not to cheer in the press box when they score a goal. You just have to be like, you know, I mean, but. That is absolutely a hundred percent true. <laughs> been hard to watch these officials. And like, some of them are just like, what? You just called three penalties in a row on the flyers. And I remember, I think it was the first three games of the season. I was like, Oh, is this going to be it? Because the one game, it was the calls were going for the Flyers, and I think it might have been it might have been Pittsburgh, the second game, and I'm like, this is just horrible, like horrible. But all right, soapbox off. They suck this year. They need to figure it out. They need to watch a lot of film. And for God's sake, talk to each other. They should have a huddle like the NFL officials do. But like, if I'm 200 feet away and I'm the ref that calls a a hooking penalty. When the guy standing right next to it doesn't, maybe you go like, "Yeah, cut this one out." Yeah, yeah. But no, I hundred, I hundred percent agree with that. Like, I, I've, they, they've, uh, what was it? Keith Jones and Jim Jackson are pretty much unbiased all the time um, when they're doing their announcing. So when you hear of a referee who's on the opposite side of the ice and they make that call, I'm like, "Well, I had the same exact thought that you just laid out. It just, it blows my mind." But so with the upcoming week, it's obviously 
it's another tough one because you were you were just laying it out earlier. You got the Cats, you got the uh, Penguins. So, what do you realistically think? You think the Flyers have an out, have, still have an opportunity? No, I don't. I think today was the nail in the coffin. Um, I hate to say it because I, I've been. I've been trying to be as optimistic about this season. Even when they're in the slide, they'll figure it out. They have a lot of talent. They really do. They're just lost right now. And it's unfortunate. But, you know, when you see that the team is not getting up for games and they're not coming out for games ready to play, something is wrong in that dressing room. Something is wrong within the, the, the coaching staff to the players, the connection there, that – you're saying what's there's something definitely wrong here. What's going to be interesting is you have the Capitals and you have the Penguins. If they blow it, lay an egg against the Caps, which they obviously can do, what did the Caps do to the Bruins today? Um, how did they come out against the Penguins? That's if they come out flat against the Penguins, just it, it's done. You know, it's on, uh, you kind of wish that today would have been the Penguins game because if you're not up for the Penguins, you should be wearing the orange and black. You know, like, yeah. I mean, that's what the yeah. fans expect you to go in and and you expect Couturier to, and Malkin to be shoving each other because they hate each other, right? right? If you're not up for that game, you shouldn't be playing in our city. And if that's the, like, that's what the fans will want, you right? And you kind of wish that that would happen today. And if they laid the egg, you could be like, all right, now we know they're done against the Penguins. They weren't able to get up for the game. We got to start shucking pieces if it makes sense and it can help the club i think the flyers so i mean like i'm the like always going to be the glass like is full until you're mathematically eliminated guy so yeah i do think they have a chance but man do the rangers like the rangers scare me more than the bruins do yeah. So I think that's where I'm at right now as far as when I look at the standings, I'm like, all right, even if we do catch the Bruins because of a, maybe a downfall, the Rangers are very tough. And, you know, even in losses, like how, how April started for Philadelphia, they've gained a point tonight. So we can't even say we're in fifth place. We're sixth place battling the Bruins, which now yeah. battling the Rangers is wild. But, I mean, the, the one thing, and I like that um... – I, I agree. Well, the the Rangers scare you because they just Zibanejad has is Wayne Gretzky against us, but um, noted flyer killer. Yep. Yeah, especially this year, right? But yeah. um, yeah. I mean, I I hope they have. I'm not right. I'm not giving up, and I won't give up on them. But I just think it's it's too big of a hill hill to climb. So, um, look, we're out of time here, so I want to let you get going here. I appreciate it for coming on. As always, you are um, always bringing good insight with the Flyers, You're always killing it for Philly Sports Network. Where can uh, anyone who's not following you, where can they follow you so they can read your, your content? Um, mostly just on Twitter. So um, on Twitter at Eric Reese PSN. Um, every once in a while, you, you might stumble upon something on Facebook if uh, Philly Sports Network is our, you know, our page. Um, I want Instagram. I have my, my uh, author, like, bio. So it's just like Eric Reese PSN once again. But, yeah, that's everything. Awesome. Well, Eric, again, thank you so much. Check him out, Eric Reese PSN on Twitter, on Philly Sports Network. He is the driving force of this Flyers team cranking out content when uh, the rest of us are too busy with life. So I thank you for coming on, dude. We got to do this again. And hopefully we can do it in about a week or two and be talking, singing about how AV is the greatest coach and the Flyers are pulling off the greatest comeback. I would be happy to do that. Let's, uh, let's, let's, let's do this as, as much as we can. All right. Thanks, Eric. All right, man. Take care. You too. And a big thank you to Eric Reese for joining us on the podcast here he is a um like i said he is a driving force he keeps us going and keeps us relevant he's down at games get, getting interviews you know he's he's just doing everything he can to keep driving content for us so again thank you eric for joining us and that's going to do it for us we're running a little bit over on time i like to try and keep our, the podcast around 30 minutes 
nice short, nice short podcast as I continue to build it um, and continue to keep going forward. Uh, got a couple things in the works here. I should be um, rolling them out soon. But um, again, uh, Sticks of Pie is brought to you by Nolan's Poorhouse Coffee. Head on over to Nolan's Poorhouse Coffee to uh, check out their their uh, supply there. Nolanspoorhouse.com. Uh, lots of great coffees, different brews from a local family out of Delco. A firefighter, a nurse, and a police officer run company. So a good family company, uh, service to their community. Give them a shout out, give them some support. Nolanspoorhouse.com. And thanks, everybody, for t- tuning in. And, uh, you know, maybe the Flyers figure it out. But it doesn't look so promising after that wonderful start. They've just free-fallen. So uh, hopefully they can figure it out. We can be getting in the playoff hockey because it's just not the same without the orange and black. Take care, everyone. Have a great week. And I will talk to you again soon.